Our mission with Travel with Meaning is to encourage, inspire, and support travel. Let's give it up for Laura Greer. So glad you're able to join us tonight. You're constantly on the go. Yes. <laughs> so where have you been this year? Um, oh, gosh. Um, I started off in Tulum, Mexico for New Year's, and then I spent the month of January in Asia. So I was in Singapore, Borneo, uh, sailing around the Komodo Islands, and then working with Nat Geo in Ubud, Bali. And then February, I was in the Caribbean, a little island called Seba Island. It's a volcano in the middle of the Caribbean. And St. Martin, doing some journalism work there about the disaster relief and stuff going on after the hurricanes. And then uh, and I go, I went to Morocco after that. Uh, I'm trying to think of where We're only going. in May, by the way, right now. We're in May. <laughs> uh, wait, I went to Morocco and then uh, straight there, London, Dublin, Ireland for St. Patrick's Day, of course. And then... Um, after that, I led, I just spent the whole month of April with some of these girls. I led a workshop in Sri Lanka, um, a women's photography media workshop there, and then went to the Maldives after that, and then I just got back, like, last week. So. Vegas, and then back. Oh, yeah, Vegas. Yeah, Vegas right. back. That doesn't really count, though. I feel like well, it's of course not. Room, I, mean, <laughs> I, want, I wanted to bring all that up because, like, literally, you're constantly on the go, and I'm like, it's May, and you've been... It's been a, it's been a crazy travel year. It's but... been a great travel year, it seems, for you. Um... Well, thank you for sharing all that. And I really wanted to bring all that up because you really do such amazing work. Yeah. Um, it's hard not to. I really, you're one of the people on Instagram that I just like totally stalk and just love the images and everything you're doing and wanted to find out where, you know, where you just were because it's, it's always so exciting. Yeah. Um, but almost like Tyler, in looking up research about you, I found that one thing that I was like, wait, this doesn't make sense. I mean, Tyler's got some crazy stories. Tyler right? has some interesting stories. <laughs> oh, my God. That was... But you, one of the first things, places you worked was the CIA. That is true. Um, I, both my parents worked for the CIA, which I didn't know until I was about 15. Um, and so once we found that out, then my parents were like, well, you've all been background checks. So you have to work there, too, because they offer like, grants for college if you're the daughter or son of an agent because you've all been background checked, so it saves, like, taxpayer dollars. So, like, I was sort of kind of forced into, like, doing that as my first job, but it was actually a really cool experience to work at Langley. I mean, like, I got to spend all of my college years, um, you know, working there with clearance and doing satellite imagery and um, target imagery, which is, like, people that they want to assassinate. I was kind of uh, developing those photos and things. Like, I was like... Uh, like, you know, like seriously having to go to like secret buildings in Northern Virginia and like deliver packages and things like the things they make interns do, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Fascinating. <laughs> that is oddly, amazingly fascinating on so many and levels. I and I learned how to Photoshop, which is what they call declassifying images in the, in the CIA, which is erasing people and things that aren't supposed to be there. That's actually how I, I learned my Photoshop. <laughs> now when I fix my bride's arms and stuff, that's where I got, I got those skills from. Well, you just mentioned brides. <laughs> you are, you're also a really you know, renowned and known um, wedding photographer. You've been doing it many years. Like 18 years. 18 years. Uh, so photography happened young, you know, as a you know, early on, CIA, wedding photography, and then travel kind of just, you've always traveled, but the whole travel photography thing just kind of came? I think um, it's funny because I was always getting in trouble for, like, talking too much in school and getting, like, kicked out of class and stuff. And my mom was like, I wanted to be, like, a marine biologist or Jacques Cousteau or something like that my whole life. I just wanted adventure. And my mom was like, I don't see you studying in, like, a laboratory. Like, you can't sit still. Like, I don't really, you know, why don't you just be, like, the photographer that follows the scientist? And I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. And then I, that's how I got interested in it. And then um, I really just like first wanted to use photography as a tool to go have adventures. And then I fell in love with photography. And then, but it is a tool to go have adventures, honestly. I want to get to that. I, I, I definitely feel like I'm, I'm remiss if I don't say, you didn't know till you were 15 that your parents are the CIA? I feel like I just remember that one. That's... It's, it's actually a really funny story. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. So I had a fake ID. It was my, I have three older sisters. So I was going to like clubs in Georgetown with them. Like, after, you know, just, I was the younger sister. And my mom like confiscated my fake ID. And I was really upset about that. And I was like, there's no way she like actually destroyed it. I bet you she like stashed it somewhere. So I went like digging through her closet trying to find my fake ID and I found like five of her alias IDs and credit cards and like purses and stuff. And that's when I was like, what? Okay, Maria Suarez, like what's going on? Wow, yeah. that's very true lies. Yeah, and that's when my mom was like, ah! you know, so that was, and then I didn't actually got my ID back and didn't get in trouble because like my mom was like, do not say anything. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
Okay, that's a first. <laughs> that's that's... How I found out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that's interesting. Okay, back to travel stuff, right? I mean, yeah. um, all right. The whole CIA thing, I think, is fascinating for you. Starting that way. Well, it was cool because like I we traveled a lot when we were younger, and I never really knew why. I mean, their their alias wasn't really. I mean, they were like, oh, we work for the State Department. I like we don't really ask questions when you're younger. So my older sisters were living in more foreign countries than me, like Brazil. And but did they all know? Your sisters? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, but, you know, by the time I, I did Indonesia, like, for the first, like, four or five years of my life, and then by that point, they didn't want to uproot my sisters anymore, so we moved back to Virginia. But we were still, like, you know, traveling, going to Puerto Rico and different places, but not living abroad. Got it. So it was kind of like, at some point when, when you and your sister forget to an age, like, have the talk of, like, what everyone's doing and... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. No, they like, never really had the talk. I think that's the whole thing with like my your parents. Like, they just are kind of like paid to not like talk and huh. tell you things. I don't know. We just never really had like. Now that I'm older, I realize that my parents just don't really talk about stuff. Like that was my norm. Like, right? I don't know. That was kind of the like, All right, I'm fascinated with that conversation. <laughs> All right, so a trip to Peru you took really kind of launched you into this whole travel um, writer, travel photography. Well, you were always doing the travel photography. But it wasn't just the traditional, even though your images are unbelievable from yeah, like yeah. Machu Picchu, the valley down there. But it was when you went for this experience, and I think that it was on Huffington Post Travel, and the title of the article was was the time I lived on a grass island with yeah, a Quechua like family. that time that I lived with a Quechua Indian family. Yeah, I've basically, so just a little backstory. I've been playing like co-ed soccer in Santa Monica for, I don't know, like since I was 21 out here. And I didn't realize that this guy on my Monday night team worked for National Geographic Catalog for years. Like we just, you know, you like show up every Monday, you play soccer, you don't like really talk about what you do. And so one day I was like posting some pictures on Facebook and their photographer that they needed to go to Peru last minute could like had a kid and couldn't go or something happened. So he asked me if like I would be willing to go. And that was like, I was like, absolutely, I'll drop everything and go. And what the National Geographic Catalog does is they um, promote what they call vanishing arts. Uh, um, so basically uh, cultures like, you know, the Quechua Indians um, that do like a special weaving or like, you know, the long neck tribe in Burma or, you know, ancient flute maker in Bali or whatever. They, they find these artisans around the world that are doing crafts that will be like lost if they don't pass them down from generation to generation. And they're ch trying to sell these arts in their catalog so they can promote like a way for them to sustain this culture and making money and then make them like continue this practice, right? So <clears throat> they started sending me down to Peru, that was my first job, to do like catalog work. And at first I was just shooting like models wearing, you know, like weavings and stuff like that. And I was like, it was like a normal fashion right. shoot. It wasn't what you would normally think of Nat Geo. And I'm like, well, this is cool. But then they asked me to go and like do stories on the actual like artisans and cultures themselves um, while I was down there. And so one of them was like going and doing like a homestay with this Quechua Indians that like they've been living like this on these floating grass islands in Lake Titicaca for hundreds of years. And I mean, like the whole island, like there's like 20 or 30 islands and each island is like one family. It's like patriarchal. And, you know, when you're on the island, Sarah was, where is Sarah? Sarah was there too. She was with me on this trip. It was crazy. Um, but when you're on the island, like the, you know, like the boat goes by and like literally the whole island moves. Like it's only, you know, like, I don't know, like four or five feet thick. So the whole mud. island is made of it's mud and grass. Mud. And so every day the men have to go out and chop down the reeds of grass and layer it on the island or the island will sink. Like every day they have to do this as their chores. And the women like weave and then they like try to sell stuff to like tourists that are allowed to come every other day and visit for an hour. Like that's it. And they can try to sell their goods. Flip and then like the, so this is like, you can see the reeds that are cut, but this is like the floating grocery store that comes every day to them on the island. And they obviously can't grow anything there. So they like cut a hole through the island and they have like nets and they go fishing and they put the fish there. And then they, you know, everything is just like all about grass. Like their houses are made out of grass, the boats are made out of grass. Um, their hats, their everything. And how long did you stay there? We were only there like a few days, but it was, I mean, they didn't, so, wait, you were talking about, how, like you back there, you were talking about how you don't speak the language with that guy with the camels. I'm like, oh, I speak Spanish. This will be easy. Well, they speak Quechua, like an ancient language. They don't speak Spanish, even though like you're in Peru. So when we got there, like it, there was just, it was all like sign language communication for like a few days. And it was actually, you forget that you don't speak the same language after like a few hours. You were just like able to get by. I get them. I did. I had to make them sign waivers for National Geographic. 
like on grass, like we're all sitting on grass and like having to like have them like, try to explain like, I mean, I don't even think they probably knew what they were signing, but like it was just a crazy thing. I mean, you definitely look like you fit in. Okay, so that was the other thing too. They made us wear the traditional outfits and yes, it's- we were very excited. What? <laughs> we, were, we were very It doesn't excited. look like you're kicking but and screaming. in all fairness, so they brand you with a hat. So if you're married, you get to wear a straw hat. And if you're single, they put a knit cap on you. So it's like single, like I'm like, you know. Like, wow. Was, like, yeah, like they, you You're learn. Yeah, I know. I was like, do they let you keep the hat? Is that something you no, take I back to the I states? Kept that okay, hat. no. It was really warm. You have there to turn like it back in. Many layers of skirts. It was kind of awesome. It was really warm. But this is me going out with Victor um, to go fishing, like on one of their. He was like my gondola, and they have like road, like pretty much like water roads going through the reeds where they go fishing and stuff. So you were there for a couple of days, and but this yeah. was the the article that really kind of turned you into a travel yeah, writer. So as I'm there, the whole point of it was like I was like at this like you know this catalog shoot, like this is the real story, like this is so cool, like the people who are in like flipping through the catalog and buying this scarf or whatever, I have no idea about like this, like what's where it's coming from, these people that are making it, and so I just felt really compelled to like write my story about my experience there. And I, you know, and I just submitted it to Huffington Post. Um, I was actually at like a dinner one night in New York and this woman like worked for Huffington Post. And I was like, I just have this travel story that I, I just don't know where it goes. Like I just, I, I just wrote it for fun. And she's like, submit it to me, I'll see. And they ended up asking me to be a contributor for them. And, and the thing is like, I was doing work for them for a while and they don't pay, like Huffington Post doesn't pay. And so everyone was like, why are you spending all this time writing? You're not making any money. And for me, I was like, no, this is just like really important. Like I, you know, imagery is powerful, but when you attach words to imagery, it's like that much more powerful and you can change the meaning of a photo just by the words you attach to it. And words are searchable on the internet. And it's just like, I felt like really compelled to start writing and that trip like launched that whole, which has completely changed my career being able to be not just a photographer, but a, a journalist as well. Well, and that article is great because you shared not just the end result of being there and interacting with these people, but like getting there and the whole, like you really felt like you were going through the experience with you um, and just kind of being there. And this is not just the traditional, you know, Machu Picchu or anything. This is, you know, the middle of Lake Titicaca and like yeah. with an and ancient, like high altitude. ancient family, ancient, you know, tradition, everything going on there. Um, so it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and Sarah's probably laughing because I had gotten some crazy like leg infection when I was there, and she was able to like like what do you call it? Help. Misdiagnose. Misdiagnose me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, she went on like WebMD and was like, "Oh, you've definitely got this," and, you know. And like we went and got like the wrong medicine, and it was like super toxic, and like put it all over it. It was like this whole. She put it on like four times. It said one time. No, anyway, so it, in I the was like the... totally <laughs> tweaking out over this medicine like while I was sitting there trying to. You're holding it in pretty well. It... Yeah, this, 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 if this is you, this is you tweaking, you're doing pretty great. This is great. Um, all right, I want to switch gears because yeah. again, you have we heard all the places you've been just since the beginning of the year. You have so many stories we could tell, um, but your images really just pop and really just jump at me. This is Nepal, mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about because I know you had a pretty profound experience in Nepal. So I wanted to see if you can just start to share a little bit of that while I flip through some images. Yeah, so basically I was doing workshops and, you know, and working in the wedding industry, I love shooting weddings. It's like one of my favorite things, but I found that it was a very kind of, um, it's a very wasteful industry as an industry whole and, and there's so much money and it's, and it's just going into like one day and not really like helping anything. And one of the things that drew me to the travel industry is that it's, it's fast growing. There's a lot of money to be made, but there's a lot of good that can be done too. It's one of the reasons I was drawn to travel with meaning and everything is that like our tourism dollars and just us being there can do so much for like a local economy and everything. So, um, I, after like kind of having this aha moment where I really wanted to start using my voice and like my writing and my photography to do good, I decided that all my future workshops, I wanted them to be philanthropic based somehow. So I had met this woman here in Santa Monica that owns the, or the Unati Foundation, which is a school for an orphanage for girls in Nepal that basically, you know, helped all the girls after the earthquake to not be sold into sex slavery. It gave them like a schooling and um, food and a shelter and all that stuff. And she really was like tired of 
people coming in just volunteering for five days and playing with the kids and leaving. She said that's all they got. They got literally busfuls of people that are visiting these kids and they like feel really good doing it. And then they leave and these kids who already have like abandonment issues are like abandoned again right. over and over and over. And so she just said, you know, I really want to do like a workshop where we teach them a skill that they could like feel empowered by and, and learn from. And so she wanted me to like not only bring a photo workshop to Nepal, but like include the orphans in the workshop. So we basically went and like partnered up like one orphan like, we set up, up into groups and we went through these villages their village and we like i had like themes like spirituality or family or love or whatever and every group had to spend like a few hours shooting along that theme <laughs> and use the little orphan as like their translator and like help them shoot and and everyone had cameras and it was like a really, really amazing experience. I mean, we went all over though. Like some people, you know, helicopters to Mount Everest and, you know, this oh, is now we're in the rocket. Well, and then this is um, Pokhara, which is like, you can kite, sur um, sorry, paraglide like down into this lake off the mountains. And, you know, we were like doing hiking and just, you know, going to the city of the dead um, where they, everyone brings their dead to be, you know, and we were there with the holy men and stuff. I mean, it was just like this really amazing cultural experience, but it was going back to a cause. And then we had a gallery show back here to benefit and all the proceeds benefited the girls and stuff too. So it was like, and we had a gallery show in Nepal too. And then all the art pieces were donated to this new hotel that was opening up. So we had a gallery show with the girls and everything. And, and then we donated the pieces to like, and a lot of it was their work too. Like the girls mm -hmm. were taking pictures as well. And so it just, for me, it was one of those things that I just wanted to like you can do so much more and empower so much more with photography and what you're doing than just like going and having a fun trip. And it was a really fun trip. Like it was an amazing adventurous trip, but just for the great message. Well, and, and I wanted to really talk about that because, you know, one thing, even like Tyler's talking about going in and working with kids. And as you said, you know, you can go and just take pictures and this is great. And, but getting a chance to actually teach a skill and interact with these kids is like that travel with meaning moment. That thing that really kind of leaves you moved, touched and inspired. For you, and you're doing workshops, is that how do you normally connect to Doom and other places? Is it organizations you normally work with? Um, usually it's kind of like serendipitous. I'll meet someone or I'll be inspired by a certain group um, and then want to plan it with them. Um, is Shireen gone already? Where's Shireen? She was here. There she is. Shireen. So the workshop we just did in Sri Lanka, Shireen is Sri Lankan, and I've known her for years and um, in the wedding industry. And so she was like, you have to come to my country. And she was just so passionate about wanting to bring people and tour around there. That 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 was like the impetus to plan a trip in Sri Lanka. And same thing with meeting the woman, you know, here about Nepal. Um, you know, we just met at a coffee shop and she was also a photographer and started this orphanage. And like, it just, it's usually like a personal connection or, you know, a place that I really want to go. But all the workshops have, have kind of happened serendipitously. Like, Where do you still want to go? Oh my God, there's so many, people are like, oh, you've been everywhere. I'm like, no, nah, the list gets longer. It gets longer and longer. Antarctica. Antarctica, for sure, Antarctica. Um, outer space too, but whatever. That's outer space. Kind of whatever. Um, I don't know, Madagascar, Mongolia, I guess all the M's are, are, I don't know why I'm on M right now. Do you have any cool like assignments or things coming up? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I mean this whole year has packed a lot of travel. I'll be um, going with reality storytellers to Israel in June and uh, they're bringing a bunch of journalists out to, to try to empower youth positively in Israel and they're giving us free reign to like tell stories in the way that we want to tell them. They, there was a grant that funded all of us to come up there. So that's going to be in June and then also South Africa is on, on the deck for that and the Azores Islands in Portugal that's on deck. July. Incredible. So, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. I'm a really big fan of yours. One, one thing I, I love is that Laura actually came to a travel talk and we connected and, be, you know, became friends and I'm a huge fan of your work. And I, I love watching people who I've gotten a chance to know through coming to travel talk and seeing how this community really, you know, brings people together. Um, one thing you shared with me that we've actually talked about quite a bit here at Travel Talk is, and actually is the quote we had up before is the, the Buddha quote is, you know, what we, we believe, what we think we, you know, comes true. And we talked, you and I were talking a lot about visualization. Yep. And we're talking a lot about how you've had this happen to you multiple times, where, you know, whether it's going somewhere to shoot or um, we can get into Morocco in a second, but I want to see if there's any of those stories even prior to Morocco that really. Yeah, that um, I mean, there's a lot of times that I'll plan like an entire adventure based on like one image that I saw. Like when I planned this crazy trip, like we basically, I don't know if you guys have heard of Coyote Butte, the wave, it's like the petrified sand dune that's in the Arizona desert. And I saw this one image and it was like this beautiful rainbow over this 
you know, petrified sand dune. I'm like, oh my God, I must find this place. And I somehow, like, I found out that you have to, like, apply nine months in advance for a permit and blah, blah, blah. So I just applied and set the date for, like, December because I was like, oh, we're going to be in Arizona for a conference. How big could Arizona be? Like, it was, like, eight-hour oh, wow. drive, you know? And I didn't know because we, like, were at this gala where we're, like, up late drinking, and then I had set the photo shoot for the next morning. It's an eight-hour drive. I rented a van and somehow convinced, like, a bunch of people in, like, costumes and makeup artists to, like, join me on this. Die for you. Like, pretty much, yeah. Like, we, no, I would not planned this out at all, but I, like, got everyone, like, every, like, the photo stuff was taken care of. We had, like, no supplies, no water. I had, like, a wilderness map that was mailed to me with, like, coordinates, and like we were allowed to go hike in on this day and I didn't know it was like a really treacherous like people died like getting lost out in the wilderness like on this hike like, I had no idea we had like I had like a backpack with like my photo gear and like 40 yards of hot pink tool and like a granola bar and some water like we it's good not, thing you had the granola bar yeah I mean it was bad it's, so we get there and like I drive throughout the whole night everyone's passed out in the back of the van like I get there at like eight o'clock in the morning the blizzard had hit and so the whole place is covered in snow. And so the way that they do the wilderness map is they act just like a photo map. So you have to like like line up the photo with what it looks like and then like go in that direction for like a few hundred yards, like what it tells you. And then you have to like line up the next picture at the next spot. That's like how the map worked. So nothing looked like anything on the map because it was all covered in snow. And we were like, oh my God. So we had like a meeting. Everyone woke up and they're like, where the F are we right now? I was like, snow everywhere. I was like, okay, guys, are we going to do this? Like, we're all the way here. Like, do we do this? And everyone's like, yes. And we, like, it was, like, we made it out alive. It was, awesome. it was like the photos were epic from this. And, and it was totally, it was like that one scene in the video where I was like, I didn't even know it snowed here. Right. Like, we, it was, we finally made it to the wave and it was like half in snow, half in shade. Like, totally not what I thought. But it ended up being this epic experience, like just the adventure getting out to it. And, but that's like the whole point. Like it was like this one photo, people were like, how did you know about this place? I'm like, oh, I saw that one rainbow photo on the internet. And then somehow, I don't know, like, <laughs> it just, but I've been inspired by like that kind of stuff before to go on trips. Like I'm a little, I'm a better planner now since that moment, you know, I learned my lessons on that. But like, same thing with Morocco. I saw this one picture of like the blue staircase, the well, famous. Well, let's get to that in a second, because yeah. I, I do want to come back to that. Cause, but I think that's, that's such a telling story for who you are as, as a traveler, but also as a photographer, like, you see that image and it like sticks with you, whether you cut it out of a, a magazine or, or see it online and you're like, oh, you just start dreaming about it and start thinking about it. Um, so from you and all these interesting travel experiences, is there that one person or place that travel with meaning moments, that, that thing that you're like, oh, it just really resonates with me? Oh God, I mean, I have, I have moments like that. I, I feel like I have moments like that here in Venice too. Like, I, I mean, I'm not even, I, I have small world experiences all the time and I feel like it means like you're exactly where you're supposed to exactly. be. And I have them when I'm traveling, you know, like just crazy stuff all the time. And um, I, I feel like serendipity, like I like to have a plan, right? I'm not like a type A person, but I feel like if you have a plan, it may not go according to plan, but at least you have a plan. Like you just, something's going to happen. So like making a plan to go on a trip, maybe planning out where you're going to stay the first night and then winging the rest of it. Mm. But like, I think ultimately, you know, like in order to have spontaneity, you have to have a little bit of a plan or an idea or something, you know, something's got to fuel you to get there and then the rest can be like wing it, you know, but I, I don't know. I'm always open to travel experiences like that. I mean, endless I mean I'm this this girl's been all over the world with me and like we we like like the stories are endless and I, I think the ones that stand out the most to me are when you feel like you're in a place that feels like it's back in time where you just feel like nothing you know you're like I could get lost here like I literally could disappear and like no one would ever find me and you know no one knows where I am and um, and you're, and it's just all, I mean, that, those are like the experiences to me where you really realize like all the stuff that you make complicated in your life, like your rent and your mortgage and listen, all that stuff. And like, you're going to get my hair down and my nails. Blah, like none of that matters. And you're like, you could literally just survive and like go get a job doing whatever, like, like a skill or something like, you know, you can survive anywhere. Yeah. And then, and then all of a sudden you're like, Oh wow, I don't need to make life as complicated. As it What's is. Well, that's right. Those experiences those, and those, um, the, the materialistic things, especially we see here, whereas I, I can remember just being in Asia and seeing that guy who probably lived in a shack and didn't care, but he was sweeping the, the sidewalk and he was smiling, happy as can be, just being who he is there and feeling that. Um, so going forward to Morocco, because your images in Morocco really, Morocco is a place I've always wanted to go. Um, oh, such a great trip. And so seeing the, these epic adventures you put together and these images are stunning. Thank you. Yeah, we had a great sunset that night. Oh my gosh. And I want to get to the Blue City. So that was the original photo that like inspired me. Does anybody here, have you guys heard of the Blue City? Know of the Blue City, been there? Okay. 
So you you saw this image and you just were kind of like drawn to it. Well, my work tell is us very about where colorful, and, and so I'm like getting a, there too. I've had like color gasms like all the time. Like I just I've literally just like color makes me happy. So um, <sighs> I saw this and I'm like I must go there and I must have like a yellow dress right there on the staircase. So I literally, <laughs> so I went there with my friends and we like trekked all the way there and everything, like got a driver and everything. And it wasn't easy to get there, right? Yeah. And I, I don't have a yellow dress and not with a long train that I wanted. So I just went to the local um, market and bought like a ton of fabric and just wrapped it with safety pins and stuff. And um, what you couldn't see behind me was probably like 15, it was like a bus of like Japanese tourists that had just that were taking all taking like fighting me to take my shot that I was just like, but um but it was like luckily the town hasn't been fully taken over by tourists but I was so excited to like I was having that moment when I was there I was like oh my god I remember seeing this image like years ago and being like I want to put a yellow dress right there and then making it happen um this is Chef Shawin it's called um it's in the north of Morocco it's probably about, like three hours north of Fez but we just went through the city and just like I mean I was scouting out like fun I mean the blue city was when all the Jews were persecuted and escaped from Europe down to Morocco and then they painted the the Jewish quarter blue and that was like the history about it so it was like finally had a dream come true for that for me but it I mean Morocco is just such an amazing colorful place like going riding out on camels and safari and just meeting the Berber people and like learning about the you know this the nomad desert dwellers and just I don't know it, it was such a great experience even like we you know had like a turban tying contest at a bar like you're just like meeting people and doing crazy stuff and it's I it's just such a there's such warm awesome people like I mean, I've heard so many people complain about like being a woman and traveling to Morocco and I had the greatest experience there but I also have to say I think having my camera has sort of given me a passport to going into huh. uncomfortable situations like people somehow like want to let me in and want me to like meet their family or whatever because I have a, a camera. I don't know. Like so I don't a, know if I can little... just show up without a camera and be treated the same way. It's a little different than having just a backpack on. It gives you at least a little kind of a conversation starter. Yeah. Interesting. Especially in, you know, where you probably don't speak the same language. People are like... Yeah, for some reason the camera is like my passport. I don't know. It's not, it's not a bad thing to have. <laughs> no, it's not a bad thing to have at all. So. With all these experiences, and we were talking before how you know experiences really shape who you are and your um, turban tying contest, <laughs> what does travel mean to you? Oh man, I think travel, it's been so embedded in my life that I don't really, it's not like a separate thing, it just is part of my life. Um, but I think for me, it's resetting myself. I always call it resetting when I go on a trip. Like mm. you get caught up and so worked up in like your own daily bubble and like what you're doing and what's important to you and like your friends and your stresses that you, you know, realize how insignificant a lot of that is when you travel. Like I, I call it the reset button where you just go out and you reset your life and what's important to you and your priorities and, you know, learn something new and open your mind to another culture. And like I, I so many things I've learned about Africa or Asia or the Middle East or anything have not been from history books or school like they don't teach you shit here in the u.s like it's all just from meeting people and going there like i we i just learned how much we don't learn about other countries like our news is a joke like you know i love going to other countries just to watch the news and actually find out what's going on in the world you know so for me i think right it's crazy Very true. well it's like it's the, it's like that first image we had up that you know not all classrooms have four walls right yeah you're getting a chance to really go and and i always say the best way to learn about something is going and meeting that person getting a chance to really experience that um i'm i'm and i said this before i'm a big fan of who you are but as your work and i'm excited to see where you're going next or what you're doing is do you have like another trip coming up immediately? I do. So immediately, um, I'm, I'm just going to Guatemala. So another Nat Geo. Just so Nat Guatemala. Geo has offices um, around, but in Antigua, Guatemala. And I always like to do like an adventure. So last time I was there, one of their artisans, this is a cool story. I should have given you a video for it. Um, they have these lava artisans. They literally make jewelry out of like petrified lava rock that you can only get from like the mouth of an active volcano. And so um, one time I was, I was like, last time I was there, I was shooting catalog shoot. And they're like, oh, Laura, can you shoot one of the artisans on Thursday morning? I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'm thinking I'm like going to his office. We drive in Jeeps and then we like go up this volcano and they're like, oh, well, their they're studio, their jewelry studio is at like the base of an active volcano. I was like, what? And so it's in the lava flow. And so I go there and I meet these two guys like Fernando and David. And they're like, yeah, we've had to relocate the store like 12 times because it erupts and like lava <laughs> takes it out. I'm like, maybe you should move the store like not on the lava flow, whatever. So they're like, hey, you need, you need to come up. We got permission for you to come up and document us getting like one of these lava stones. 
at the mouth of the volcano. And I was like, oh my God, like, this is so cool. We wasn't planning on anything. So we're like hiking. It's like straight up. It's like an hour up this like crazy um, volcano. And it's like smoking. You can hear the volcano like breathing. It's like, like, you know, you're like, it's very active. And I was like, so like, what's our plan? Like if this thing erupts, they're like, well, we parked the Jeep downhill. So I was like, that's our, I was like, our backup plan was the Jeep's parked downhill. <laughs> so um, literally, basically, if it erupts up there, you're, you're dead. So um, I'm like going up there. I'm like, okay, cool. And I was like, so mesmerized when I got to the top of the volcano, you could actually stand and like look into the crater and a new volcano is forming inside of it from when it erupted before. And it was like, all these insects were flying around because they like feed off of the, the sulfuric, whatever, like the, the steam and everything. So, um, and it was just like, so weird. You're up there and there's just like swarms of these crazy, almost like dragonflies like all around you and like this like, you know, toxic fumes. And I was just like taking pictures and they're like, okay, we got the rock, like, let's go. And I was like, wait, just a few more minutes. And I'm like sitting there taking photos and, and they're like, no, really, we shouldn't spend too much time up here. Um, but it was one of my favorite trips. And so like, that's what I told them next time I go, which will be in two weeks. Like I want to hike one of the, because there's so many volcanoes there. I want to hike one of the, the next volcanoes there. Wow. But it's, but that was like what they're, but that was what was so cool. Like you would look at this like necklace online and not think anything of it. It's like a coconut shell, with some lava stone in it. And it looks like a, like a tchotchke necklace that you could get anywhere. But you're like, this guy's risking his life to go hike up and get the stone to make this necklace. And they believe, the Mayans believe that it's like that is like the most energy, like it's like healing energy to make it out of like to wear that stone close to you that comes from the earth. You know, like it was like, there's like all this meaning behind it and and like nobody understands that. So that's I like did this whole video and like documenting and then oh we roasted marshmallows at the top. <laughs> that was cool. Too. Obviously. <laughs> We, we hiked up with like graham crackers and marshmallows because we were like, I mean, you got to risk I love how you almost left that part out. No, we had the Jeep going down, but like the, we got the, you know, yeah. <laughs> marshmallows and graham crackers. So you're heading back there in a couple weeks. Yeah. All right, so Laura Greer Travel, all social, right? Yeah. Okay, just because we're going to have to, now I want to definitely follow you to see what's going on when you go back <laughs> up to the volcano.